need to hear you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, today we're talking about how spot instances are pushing the boundaries for some big data applications. Spot instances. How many of you have heard of them before? Higher. How many of you have used them? Fair amount. Great. Um, for those of you who haven't heard about spot instances before, they're regular EC2 instances that we put out in the spot market when they're not being used for regular on-demand requests. Prices are on average 70 to 80% lower than on-demand, and they're best used for workloads that can scale with compute. For example, you can quicken your jobs five to 10 times, say run your CI CD pipelines faster, or you can scale your web apps 10x, as several of our customers like Mapbox have done. Today we're talking about how you can generate better and faster business insights from your event streams. Event streams that can stretch from a few hours to several years in the past. My name is Anu Sharma, and I'm the product manager for EC2 Spot Instances. So please feel free to come grab hold of me if you have questions or feedback after the session. Before we dive in, a quick overview of what we'll cover today. We'll briefly touch upon the use case and the history of how business intelligence applications have evolved. Then Gaurav and Durga from AOL will talk about how they run their Presto clusters on EMR and spot instances. They'll also talk about how they use Lambda to orchestrate their job workflows. In the second half of the session, Charles from MetaMarkets will talk about how he uses spot instances for Spark and Druid clusters. The use case that we're talking about today has billions of events flowing into your system per second. And this event data generally looks the same across the industry. There's a timestamp. There's a set of dimensions or measures that you want to uh, aggregate against. Sorry. Can you screen it? Okay. Thank you. Every time you move. Thanks. Uh, there's a set of dimensions or attributes that you want to aggregate against. And there are metrics or values that you want to aggregate. There are several ways of approaching the problem, and relational databases have been around forever. The traditional way to build a data warehouse has been a star schema where you have a central fact table and you query it by joining the, with the various dimension tables. This works until, for a smallish data set, and as the data scales, your performance tends to degrade. <laughs> Key value stores, these have been Several of these have been popular in the last few years, and the great thing about them is that you have fast writes and fast lookups. And there are two common patterns with key value stores. Pre-computation, where every expected query is pre-computed. The problem with this is that ad hoc queries are not supported to start with, and as you add more columns, the query space grows exponentially, and again, performance falls off. The second pattern is range scans where the primary key is a hash of the timestamp and the dimensions, and the value is the metric that you want to aggregate. Usually, you would shuffle data from where it is stored, pull it into a, an intermediate compute buffer where the numbers are crunched and the results are returned to the user. This shuffling of data, this, this scan, can, take a, can be slow, can take a while, because it's difficult to add intelligent indexes to the primary key in the key value stores. General compute engines, several of these are popular today, and in fact, we'll talk about a couple of them in this session. And the way a lot of general compute engines work is very similar. They pull a lot of data from where it is stored into an intermediate compute buffer where the numbers are crunched. Now, if you can scale the compute in this architecture, then you can generate results faster. And if you can generate results faster, you can generate more results. As you know, Data analysis is an iterative process. You ask questions based on the answers you get, and the faster you get answers, the more questions you can ask. But even here, there's a performance overhead. There's a lot of shuffling going on. And the difference between a few minutes for the query to run, or even a few seconds, versus a few hundred milliseconds can be the difference between interactivity and non-interactivity. -interactiv and that's what Charles will talk about, how he uses spot instances to run interactive applications. And with that, hopefully we'll share a theme here. The journey of moving, or of building new technologies and moving them into your daily life as if they're a regular part of it. 
to the point that they're boring. And that's when we know we have a story to tell. Thurga? I'm a system architect at AOL, and I work with big data. To give you a brief background, in 2015, we had an in-house Hadoop cluster, and we migrated the data and processing from that in-house Hadoop cluster into Amazon Cloud. Rather than migrating the cluster as is, creating a Hadoop cluster in the cloud, migrating the data and the jobs into it, we chose a different approach. We decided to store the data on S3 and use transient EMR clusters to process the data. Rather than having one cluster and running multiple jobs on that cluster, trying to scale it up and down, we decided to create a separate cluster for each job. This allowed us to scale massively across multiple AWS regions, tapping into the spot markets in all those regions. I have put together a small slide with animation to illustrate how our architecture works. At the center of our architecture is Amazon S3. As I mentioned, we store all of our data and code on S3, and we use S3 as our data lake. When there is data ready to be processed, we spin up an EMR cluster, which would read the data and the code from S3 and write the output, the transformed or the aggregated output back to S3, and it would shut down. There are several EMR clusters spinning up and down, uh, coming in and out in different regions and different availability zones, all doing the same thing. <coughs> We have orchestrated all this using AWS Lambda, which Gauru will talk in detail about. We have used Amazon's DynamoDB to store some of our uh, data validation metrics. We use IAM to control access to all of our data, um, who can read, who can write, and ensuring that those uh, are enforced. We stored the data on Amazon S3, although I didn't have the uh, icon there. We stored the data on S3 encrypted using server-side encryption. So that uh, is also a very good thing and very easy thing to do. So far, what you see on the left side of the slide is how we process the data. We like this model of separating our compute and storage and ability to scale across multiple regions for all of our data processing. We like that model so much. We wanted to extend that into our data analytics side. Now, it's a little bit of a challenge to adopt the same model for data analytics because we needed longer running clusters and ensure that users don't have any disruption. We were able to achieve that by separating our metadata from our data. So we store our metadata about the data in an Amazon RDS Hive Metastore. That Hive Metastore has the mapping of which table or which data set resides where on S3. An Amazon EMR cluster spins up with Presto pre-installed connects to the Hive RDS, and immediately knows where the data is on S3. It attaches itself to an elastic IP address to which the users connect. Since there is no data loading involved, since we store all of our data on S3, it only takes 10 to 15 minutes to spin up this cluster, and it is immediately available to all the end users for running their queries. We could use 
spin up another cluster, which again connects to the same RDS Metastore, and immediately knows where all the data is, attaches itself to another elastic IP address to be used by a different client or group of users. All of this it may has been made even better by the announcement of Amazon Athena this morning, where you could just have Athena read data directly from S3, and your users could run query, and you could achieve a truly serverless data lake. To summarize, these are the key features and advantages that we have achieved through our architecture. We separate our compute and storage, store the data on S3. We use Amazon EMR with Hive to process our data. It would allow us to separate our processing and analytics. We could use Hive for processing, Presto for analytics. And since there is no data being stored locally in all these clusters, there is no data migration involved. <coughs> and using S3 as a single source of truth enables us to avoid the confusion of multiple data systems being loaded independently. We use columnar format, parquet columnar format, to store all of our data. That allows us to compress it and also allows the performance. We launch all of our clusters in VPCs for our operational uh, security requirements, and we are still able to operate with this model, leveraging the spot instances, leveraging all the AWS regions, by just creating VPCs in all of those regions and still adhering to our IT security policies. So with that, I would uh, turn it over to Gaurav to talk in detail about the cost optimization and Lambda orchestration. Thanks, Durga. Good morning, everyone. So as Durga explained our architecture, how we use uh, EMR, uh, which are not persistent, uh, we launched like hundreds of EMR. So once we moved all our processing to AWS, the next thing we wanted to is further optimize the cost because you want to save as much money as you can. Also, we wanted a mature pipeline uh, so that multiple dependencies and right from source to the final summary, everything is taken care without having a lot of dependency on operations which are like manual and it, it impacts SLA. So in case you have not used spot instances, a few things I'll definitely recommend to take care is uh, availability. Uh, as Anu mentioned, that it is different than on-demand. You have to go through a bid process. So sometimes you might not find uh, spot instances as, as much in capacity as on-demand. Also, the spot price vary between different uh, instance type for each AZ. So if M3X large is two cents in Virginia, uh, Virginia region, it might be three cents or four cents in Europe. So you have to make sure you're taking that factor into consideration to make sure you're taking the full ad advantage of spot cost. Also, the provisioning time can be a bit different. In our use case, we process most of the batch data, so a little bit extra provisioning time was acceptable. In case you're planning to use spot instances, I'll highly, highly recommend you to revisit that so that you're not impacting your SLA. For our particular requirement, for our team, our capacity requirement is around 15 to 20,000 EC2 instances. These are complex clusters which run for a few hours, so compute hours are around 50 to 60,000 compute hours. On a normal day, on a daily basis, we need around 10 to 11,000 compute hours. The data volume is around a few terabytes, and we process data for multiple countries since our brands are global. The frequency of data processing is from hourly, till then daily processing, then monthly after that. So to make sure we are making use of all the regions, what we did, as Durga mentioned, we set up our VPC in different regions. Then we worked with the support team to increase our spot limits in these regions so that we are, making, uh, we are taking the advantage of multiple instance types. Apart from the AWS limit, what, it, what we did was we set up a hard limit for ourselves. The reason we did that was we did not want to put too many requests 
in a particular AZ. Suppose you find Virginia A region as the cheapest and you dump 10,000 spot requests, you might end, end up competing with yourself. So to spread the load across multiple AZs, we set up a limit that we are not going to put uh, request after X, X number. Uh, to find the optimal cluster size, we consider two factors. First is the data volume. So let's say we are trying to process 100 gigabytes of data. Then after that is the code complexity. If you are doing a simple select operation, 200 or 300 nodes might be enough. But if you are doing complex operations like joins or distinct values, you might need more number of nodes. To find the optimal cluster size, that's why the combination of these two is really important. And if you're worried that your spot instances might be taken away due to bid price increase, so the trick that we follow is we bid a little bit higher. So even if you, uh, even if you bid higher, you're, you're paying actual price. You're not paying the bid price. So when the algorithm kicks into the place that spot price is increased, and if you're under that value, you'll still not lose that cluster. So to quickly walk through the deployment that we do. For a particular data set, based on the code complexity and data volume, uh, we know how much cores we need. For that particular data set, then we know what instance types are acceptable. So we find out the pricing for that instance type across all AZs. Then we, find, we pick the cheapest AZ, and we check how many requests are already running. Let's call it B. So the number of cores that is required is A. If A plus B is less than the hard defined limit, we kick off the EMR. If, it is, if there is no bandwidth, then we go to the next AZ. And if we run out of all AZs, we go to the next instance type. So this cycle repeats. And what happens is that now you have spread your workload across multiple AZs. It has rarely happened that we have exhausted all AZs, uh, even with like 20,000 EC2 instances. So let's walk through the actual saving graphs. If you had to do a similar model using on-demand, I will not recommend that, because that will be real expensive. So if you choose to hard code your AZ, that means all your EMRs are launching in the same AZ, you'll still end up saving 80%. That is no brainer. But if you go one step extra, that means you're finding the cheapest AZ across multiple regions, that can save 15, 10 to 15%. But a question might come to the mind that if you're launching an EMR in a region which is not default, or default to the S3 bucket, there is a data transfer cost. So let's walk through the worst case scenario where your cheapest AZ is not in your local region. One thing to keep in mind is that more data you have, more nodes you will need to process the data, and it might also require more compute hours. So the way to read the table is supposed to process 10 gigabytes of data. You need 25 cores. The EMR runs for an hour. So in your default region, suppose it's, co it's costing you 429. And in the cheapest AZ, it's costing you 356. There is a data transfer cost of $73, summing up to 429, so you're not saving anything. But this, this is the use case for the lower volume. Once you do the math for the higher data volume, that's where the saving, savings come into the picture. So if you see the lowest row, for 300 gigabytes, you are, you are, you'll kick at least 15% of savings. And this we are talking about is the worst case scenario. At AOL, we process terabytes of data. And that's why this is really critical that we identify the cheapest AZ and do all the processing in that AZ. So does it really happen that your cheapest AZ is not in your local region? So this is actually the production distribution for our EMR workloads. Uh, I think on an average, we have 1,000 production EMRs. So in a month, we have like 30,000 EMRs. 80% of the time, our EMR was not in Virginia region. So in fact, 28% time, it was in Europe. So I'll highly recommend you to identify that logic if, you re if you're re really serious about the spot savings. So the next step that we did was the implementation of optimal cluster size. By doing that, we found out that there is an average saving of around 18 to 19% depending on the project. Since the data volume is not same for multiple projects, also the complexity is different for different projects. 
Uh, this is also really important. So takeaway for the cost savings is that find the optimal cluster size and launch your cluster in the optimal AZ. The next thing is the orchestration. If How many of you deal with big data or data science? OK, less number of people. So if you are working in a big data or data science world, having a mature pipeline is really important because right from when you get the data till the final output, there are multiple stages involved. You have to make sure you're taking care of all the dependencies so that the output data is correct. Uh, one of the things that was important to us was we wanted the solution to integrate with different data services. Our workload was already on EMR model using S3. We also explored DynamoDB and Redshift. So we wanted something which integrates with all the AWS services. We started with few few hundred clusters, and the current workload is few thousand clusters. So we wanted something which can scale. So if there are more brands, we did not want any issues with that. And with so many clusters, there, there are bound to happen failures. So we wanted something which can recover, notify operations. So I'll try to explain you using a simple directed acyclic graph. Consider this tree. So right at the top is your source data. Then you're creating multiple stages. And the lowest level is your final output. So for example, E, your data set E is dependent on B, C, and A. Someone who is in operations can remember this uh, simple graph very easily. But business always adds the complexity. What they'll ask is, OK, I want to update B. I also want to make sure everything that is downstream has to be updated. And to add to further complexity, they want it to be done for 730 days or two years or six months. So this poor guy in operations has to make sure everything gets updated and the data integrity is met. So to solve this problem, what we thought, do we really need to touch each and every node in this tree? How about we just start at the top of the tree and everything downstream takes care, takes care, uh, is taken care automatically? So what we do is we drop a file for the top node of the tree on S3 that kicks off a Lambda function, which takes care of the deployment logic, ensures dependencies, and kicks off an EMR. So suppose for this EMR, there are two dependencies. So this EMR will drop two files on your S3 bucket, which will kick off the Lambda function, which will again kick off the deployment logic, and your EMRs are kicked off. So the only thing that operation person has to take care is the top of the tree, Everything at the bottom is taken care automatically. So moving to this model has improved our SLA huge in like really in a significant way because before we used to do a traditional model of scheduling, we used to check every hour whether the data is ready. It has moved to an event, event driven design. It's serverless. There is no uh, server or anything to maintain because uh, Lambda is serverless. Pricing-wise, uh, it has saved a lot of, uh, it has saved thousands of dollars because they provide you million requests free per month, and we don't launch millions of EMR. Uh, the Autosys is a scheduler that we used to use. By creating generic utilities, which scales across multi, like every project and different countries, we have shut down like more than 2,000 jobs just by two Lambda codes. So it's, it scales automatically. Uh, and also, you don't need to worry about logging because everything gets uh, logged in CloudWatch. So the last point I wanted to mention, since we have thousands of clusters, we wanted something uh, to take care of failures. Uh, you might have failures due to network issue or uh, suppose spot price. So we wrote a custom utility called Prunella. What it does, every 10 or 15 minutes, it wakes up and it collects the data for failed clusters and the clusters which are running long, which are in starting state. It writes an entry to the DynamoDB, and as soon as an entry is done to DynamoDB, a Lambda function gets kicked off. So this particular function basically drops the file on S3 for that failed cluster, and the whole cycle again gets kicked off. So And the notification is sent to operations. So this is a very simple utility that we use using AWS Lambda 
to take care of all the EMR for monitoring. Few things that we expect will be helpful to us with uh, AWS is uh, if the lifecycle policies are done based on tags instead of file, file timestamp. Uh, we are seriously exploring Redshift as a, for the database solution, so if Redshift can talk to S3 using external tables, that will be helpful to us. Also, if I use DMR, currently you have to go to each region if you want to explore it using console. So something like a global dashboard will help us as well. We have passed this request to EMR and uh, team, and they are working on it. So to recap quickly, Durga explained to you how we do spot transient architecture using S3 as our data lake, how we find out the optimal cluster size uh, and launch the cluster in optimal AZ to save and take the full benefit of spot instances, how we have created a pipeline using AWS Lambda, which is serverless and event-driven, and a custom utility that we have written to monitor thousands of uh, EMR clusters so that we are not heavily dependent on operations. We did a talk last year, if you are interested, how to migrate from data center to AWS. Uh, here are the links, and please stop by if you have more questions. With that, I'll turn it over to Charles. Thank you for coming today. Uh, my name is Charles Allen. I am a uh, head of platform at MetaMarkets. Uh, you can see my contact information up here. Special thanks to my colleague, Jisoo Kim, who's one of our lead engineers dealing with the spot market. So a little bit about who I am and what we do at MetaMarkets. We're an ad tech company that focuses on servicing the uh, ad tech ecosphere and allowing them to do slice and dice analytics in real time on their data streams. One of the big challenges we have in the ad tech ecosphere is that there is a huge quantity of data coming off all the time. Anytime you go to a website, anytime you bring up an application, anytime you play a game, there becomes availability to show you an advertisement. All of these availabilities have to get logged somewhere and people have to be able to look at them and see what's going on. By our estimates, the quantity of these transactions that occur are over 100 times larger than what happens on the New York Stock Exchange on a daily basis. So not only is the data long, but the quantity of fields and the complexity of how you analyze those fields is also much greater. So we're about 100 times longer and potentially about 10 times wider than most of the data that you see related to what's coming off of, for example, the New York Stock Exchange. We like to say move fast, think big, be open, and have fun. Uh, we are an industry leader for interactive analytics uh, and programmatic marketing. We handle over 100 billion events per day that peaks at a sustained approximately two to three million events per day. Once it has been massaged, we've had our real-time streams all joined together, and they have been a high availability replicated So, in order for uh, to protect against node failure. That turns into about three million events per second that go into our query engine. One of our cool things that we are able to do is that we can take event ingestion lag downtime down to a few milliseconds if required. Uh, this, of course, depends on exactly how complex the operations you need to have done are. Uh, if you're waiting for a click to come in before you can actually say anything about events that happened, of course, we can't quite predict the future yet and uh, have to wait for that event to come in before we can actually tag it uh, as being a click event. We do dynamic queries, meaning that we do not do any pre-aggregation or, or uh, uh, pre-slice and dicing. All of the things that we do are done ad hoc at query time. So we store the data in a flat format and have a specialized query engine called Druid that allows us to do dynamic slice and dice queries on a huge quantity of data. Query latencies of less than one second for the queries that matter is incredibly common within our system. And all of our product and all of our processing is directly tailored towards real-time bidding and insight on real-time bidding streams. So uh, real quick, I was gonna show you guys a little bit um, about what our product looks like and the, a couple of the ways that people use it. We're on hotel Wi-Fi here, so it will kind of work and kind of not work, so bear with me for just a minute. So here we can see a view that a particular person may have in relation to being in an exchange. And what's going on is that real-time data is streaming through our system to the tune of a couple million events per second, and you're able to go in and decide 
what kind of views you might have. So if you're an exchange or an advertiser or a DSP, you can go in and say, these views are specially customized towards the way that I look at this real-time data. You can go in and you can say, okay, I want to look at all my publishers. Okay, here's my publishers sorted by the different uh, quantity of auctions. I want to know how's Karma Life doing. I can go in and I get instantaneous responses on what my uh, ECPM, my gross revenues are, all that for uh, how Karma Life is doing. Uh, if I'm wanting to do any sort of audience kind of related stuff, I also have user segments I can go in and I can say, oh, cool, I get a lot of auctions for up and comers. Um, uh, am I also getting impressions for those? Yes, I'm actually getting a lot of impressions for those. That's really nice. If you want to go see how many people you're actually reaching, we also have the capacity to do uniques. So you can do uniques over time, which is the bottom part down here. Uh, this is approximate uniques. Uh, if we want to sort by uniques, which is computationally intensive, so hopefully it'll come back pretty soon. There it goes, okay. So um, we've just calculated you know, millions and millions, mm, billions almost, of uh, uniques there uh, across various user segments. If I want to do any sort of slice and dice on them, I'm going to change it back to something that's a little bit less computationally intensive. Uh, if I want to go look at the slice and dice on these particular segments, I can actually split them up. And I can say, OK, well, here's how these different things performed over time. And so I get all this capacity to do my diagnostics, my insight, my prospecting, my um, retrospective analysis, it, and essentially as fast as I can think about it. And that's really what we try to deliver, is the really, really fast user interactive experience on real-time data streams. So the big question I hope you're asking yourself right now is how do we do that? Well, I'll go over the brief architecture that we have in order to accommodate this torrent of data that's coming into our system. And I'm also going to highlight a couple key points where we make use of the spot market in order to do all of this in a cost-effective manner. Our current spot usage comes in three flavors. We have heavy spot usage for Spark, we have heavy spot usage for Druid, and heavy spot usage for Jenkins. Uh, the Jenkins use case is really boring because it encompasses like five nodes, woo! But the uh, Spark and Druid use cases are much larger, um, encompassing uh, thousands of cores. So uh, I will talk mostly about how we use Spark and how we use Druid. For those of you who may not be as familiar with the big data ecosphere, uh, Spark is like what the cool kids are using instead of Hadoop these days. And Druid is a um, query engine built to analyze time series data in very fast slice and dice manners. So the architecture that we use in order to take in all our data and make it available is known as the Lambda architecture, which means that it has a real-time component and a batch component. Here we see the main things that make up our real-time component. Our initial intake point is a Kafka cluster, and this Kafka cluster is where all the data initially goes in, and its main purpose is simply to catch data. It doesn't really do anything special. Its sole purpose is to make sure that when data comes to us, we can catch it. So if you're looking at it from a kind of data lake kind of perspective, Kafka acts as our data lake at, the, at this particular point. From there, for the real-time portion, it goes into a combination of Kafka SAMSAs, where Kafka is the thing that is storing the data at rest, and SAMSA is the thing which is acting on the data as it flies around the system. The SAMSA component here does things like correctly doing ETL on the individual components, on the individual records, correctly making sure that multiple data streams that have events that need to be joined together are actually being joined together. And then finally, it gets pushed over into the Druid real-time component. The key advantages of our real-time pipeline are that it's pretty accurate, but it delivers data incredibly fast, pretty much as fast as you want us to be able to deliver it. The downside is that it's only pretty accurate and not quite perfectly accurate. We also have a batch component, which is the other part, and that comprised of, of the same initial Kafka cluster, which is persisted into S3. Uh, and then Spark does work on the data that comes out of S3 and pushes the results of that data uh, into Druid for historical analysis. So in this particular scenario, we are using S3 as the data lake. So essentially, we push into the data lake from Kafka to S3 and then do processing from S3 to another spot on S3, which then gets loaded into our Druid historicals. This happens typically to the tune of a few hours later uh, that is configurable and is largely largely there to handle potential real-time outages, which we can adjust 
the latency of this batch processing if needed to speed it up or slow it down. Uh, we also have it there to handle deduplicated data and late data, because uh, as sophisticated as we try to be on our side, uh, we also have to live in the real world where sometimes it's not our, our, our side that has problems and customers end up sending us late data. So this, this is the part that handles that. Putting it all together, we have the top part which comprises our real-time pipeline where we go from Kafka to real-time to, to eventually being handed off to historicals. And the bottom part, which happens a few hours later, is our batch processing, which goes from Kafka into our batch system and then gets loaded into the historicals from there. One of the cool things about Druid is that whenever you're issuing queries into it, it has the capacity to both hit the real-time component and the historical components at the exact same time. So you get data as soon as it's available. And uh, I mentioned Lambda up there. Uh, there's a lot of Lambda being thrown around this week. Uh, this is called, this is a Lambda architecture. It's actually the name of this style of architecture. So just so you know. So again, just to reiterate, our key technologies that we use are Kafka, Samza, Spark, and Druid. We actually run our own versions of all of these, uh, and we contribute back to the open source communities for all of these. So you'll see multiple people from MetaMarkets on the list of people who have contributed to these products. Spark on spot. I love Spark on spot. It's great. Uh, we were running Hadoop on AWS before EMR even existed, and it worked well for quite a while, but it became a huge pain for us to be able to have to manage uh, both Hadoop and HDFS and all these other things. Essentially, it mean, meant that one cluster was actually a whole bunch of different kind of clusters that we had to keep track of. We said, we didn't really like that. Uh, we want to be able to use the spot market a little more because this batch recovery side, that can take a while. If it has to take a little bit longer, that's not the end of the world. We can live with that, our customers can live with that because they have the mostly accurate data already there. So we looked at Spark and we said, oh, okay, this is great. Not only can we run the things on spot pretty well, we don't have to deal with all these extra clusters, we are all these extra components of our cluster. Uh, it has pretty good partial failure recovery that we found, so its retries are pretty nice. It also has great native support for Mesos, Yarn, and as a standalone cluster. Uh, and this is something that's become very important to us recently, where essentially once you have something on the spot market, you have essentially this big heterogeneous pool of resources. You have to be able to manage them and launch things on them and keep track of them. Having something out there that is made to manage uh, heterogeneous resources like Mesos, Yarn, or a standalone Spark is very, very advantageous. The only real bad thing that we found across the transition to Spark on um, uh, Spark on Spot was that it's really rough to configure multi-tenant. So whenever you have these highly heterogeneous clusters, you're going to have different capacity in all these nodes, and often you're going to have multiple Spark tasks run co-tenant on a particular machine. Now, we found out the hard way to start with that there's a lot of places within both the Spark code and even within the JVM itself that assume number of cores is the correct thread setting for various things, including Jetty settings and uh, garbage collection settings. So you can imagine if you're running an X132XL and every single subcomponent that runs on an X132XL, all been packed and managed through Mesos, Yarn, or Standalone, thinks that it has all 128 uh, nodes to itself then it's gonna end up with a lot of things that are wrong uh, when it actually tries to run. So you have to do a little bit of conf configuring and a little bit of con proper containerization to make sure that the sparks that you're running on a, a heterogeneous spot cluster actually do the things that you want it to do and that it understands the resources that it has available. Uh, memory is another component where I've had to do a lot of configuration changes. So making sure that Spark properly understands the difference between heap memory direct memory and page cache, and getting those to be taken into account properly is another place where uh, you have to be careful about doing things in a multi-tenant environment. How much data do we actually push through Spark? Uh, Spark has a really cool metric called memory byte spilled. That's essentially when it starts to sense that it has too much space that it's trying to take up locally, it spills it, spilled some of it to disk. We typically do between one and four petabytes a day, uh, and that's comes to be between 200 billion and a trillion events per day. Peak days, though, can be up to five times baseline. So with our Spark cluster, we can very easily greatly grow uh, on spot up to five times what our baseline load is without any sort of problems and then scale back down once we don't need that anymore. 
our spot pricing strategy is not as aggressive as some other people. Uh, we aim for amortized savings and ease of management and developer sanity. So instead of trying to squeak every last penny of savings out, we aim for pretty good savings and ease of management. So in our use cases, in our real time, or our actual usage in production, we tend to get at least 60% savings versus on demand with minimal to no effort to actual cost uh, management. This is more, more retrospective being like, if things get too expensive for too long, switch the strategies. Otherwise, don't worry too much about it. To compare that, we get approximately equal to what a three-year uh, uh, commitment would be, but we're not locked into a particular instance type. So uh, after the announcements this morning, I'm going to go back and talk with my team and be like, hey, do we want to use some of these? Those R4s look pretty nice. So uh, we'll see how that goes. So the trade-offs here, uh, running Spark on spot, you have a little bit more complex job failure handling. The big questions we end up asking ourselves are, did my job die because of me? Was this a new bug at Spark that I didn't find yet? Because we tend to run both on very close to the edge of Spark as well as with our own patches. Uh, is this something that went wrong in the data? Did the customer change their data format and not tell us and we didn't detect it properly? Or is the spot market itself just having some sort of fluctuation or a strange day? This means that you may have a couple more random delays uh, but for us, since it's a batch pipeline, we have pretty good monitoring on our batch pipelines, so we can adjust and respond appropriately pretty well. This means it's going to be a couple more man hours to manage or a little bit more automation to build, but uh, overall we found it very worth it, and it also provides a fun chunk of technical uh, interesting problems for developers to sink their teeth into. Druid on spot. So being a query engine, Druid on Spot has a very interesting property that not a lot of other things have. One, it's built for interactive query processing, but two, it also stores a lot of state locally. So instead of having stuff that's all over the place that it has to go and figure out where to do things on, it knows where data is located and then it executes queries based on where the data is. So that state is stored locally per node. Some of our historical nodes, which are the nodes that run all the state locally, run on spot. Not all of them, some of them do. And we use EBS to do that. We have almost a fifth of a petabyte of EBS, which is dedicated towards running uh, these Druid nodes on spot. The cool thing about that is that we have a fifth of a petabyte of data that can absolutely vanish, but then come back in 15 minutes. We accomplish this, uh, oh, yeah, we'll talk about this one first. So a little bit about what that means and where that comes into play and where we can actually exercise that. Typically, this historical data has some decaying value to our customers. We define the data into three different tiers. We have a hot, a cold, and an icy. Effectively, how it works is that the hot data is the stuff that people are querying all the time. These are the, this is the data that's most recent, most valuable, except for the real time. The real time is even more recent and hopefully more valuable. And we want to be able to make sure that that data comes back as quick as possible. Typically, our, it's customizable per client, but typically our clients store between uh, uh, things greater than an hour up to a couple months in our hot tier. Cold tier is are things that are a little bit longer uh, in time range and usually not queried nearly as often. That typically tends to be on the order of a few months in the, in the history to a few more months, but not quite to the year scale. So very commonly, it'll be like a quarter or two quarters or something like that. In our IC tier, we typically keep all the rest of the data. So we're like, okay, you have this data that's historical data that you don't look at very often, and most of our customers understand that like, it'll take a little bit longer to access that data. So we have this IC tier that allows us to do queries in the same system, not only on stuff that's happening right now, but look two years in the past and see what was happening two years ago, if so required. Luckily, that's not a very common demand. And so if we look at the actual QPS that we see on these query nodes, we tend to have a logarithmic fall off per tier, where most people are looking at what's happening on hot, some people are looking at what's happening on cold, and every once in a while, someone wants to know what happened a very long time ago. There is a component that does the aging off of data and says, okay, data, you're old enough to where you don't need to be in hot anymore. 
you can go over to cold. Okay, data in cold. You're not needed anymore to be in cold. You can uh, age out into icy. That thing is called the coordinator, just because I'm gonna mention it here in just a minute. So the coordinator says, okay, you can go from hot to cold and cold to icy. Uh, the cool thing about this particular setup is that you don't have to be exclusively in hot or cold. You can be in both. So all of the data that is in hot is replicated in cold, and all of the data that is in cold is replicated in icy. That means we have very good failover. So if any one particular node goes down, it has a lower SLA tier that is able to pick up all of its work just fine. So if you were to look at this graph and try to guess which part has the uh, most redundancy overall to where you can tolerate failures best, you'd probably say you're right about there. So if things have problems there, we can fail over to icy, and we also have uh, a certain amount of redundancy that happens in hot. So this is actually where we use the spot market for Druid, because if the state disappears, we have the appropriate amount of failover, and uh, we also have the capacity if someone is doing uh, long reports where we can adjust what our compute needs are, but that does not scale as fast simply due to the amount of state that is required on that. We do this by being able to take EBS volumes that are on our cold nodes, detaching them when we detect, detect that there's a spot market fluctuation, and then reattaching them when new nodes come online. So this only works if you're able to like, play within the same availability, uh, availability zone, uh, but we found that we typically can. Uh, we found sometimes, for example, like an R3 4X large is really, really expensive, but for whatever reason, the R3 8X larges still have really low price, so we're like, fine, we'll use R3 8X larges instead. We don't care that we have the extra resources, right? So with using Dru uh, EBS with Druid on spot, we define a pool tag for our EBS volumes. If the EBS pool is empty, we simply will create a new volume. Otherwise, we simply claim one from the pool. Uh, do a quick sanity check on the volume, and if it's unrecoverable or has some sort of uh, permanent error, just discard it and we'll create a new one. Once we're actually running, we do some monitoring of uh, the APIs that uh, Amazon provides to make, see whether or not we are about to be terminated on spot. If we think we're going to be terminated on spot, we stop the application, cleanly unmount the volume, but we don't actually terminate the instance, we wait for death. So whenever AWS comes in and terminates us, we get that hour for free, and then uh, if something went absolutely horribly wrong, then we can at least go in and debug the instance and figure out what happened. Originally, we actually ran Druid without using EBS reattachment, so uh, every once in a while, when we got one of these little search messages that appeared in our email, it was gonna be an interesting day, but we now have put EBS reattachment in place. Uh, we still get these messages, but they're just ignored. They originally were incredibly terrifying to get, but now it's just mundane. By the time we actually have noticed that it has happened, it usually has fixed itself, and it's, it's just not as interesting anymore, which is a very good problem to have. If you're running Druid on spot, a couple of tips that I wanna kinda call out. Uh, the coordinator, that little thing that, thing that decides what needs to go where, does not do very well if you only have half of a tier of, a, of stuff available. So if your cold tier is hacked in half, the coordinator is not going to like that. It is typically better to kill that tier completely until you can fix things if you can't fix them fast enough, uh, rather than let instances flap up and down, because the coordinator gets very confused about where it can put things, and it might take way, way, too long reaching solutions on where things should go rather than uh, being able to move forward. As a side note, nodes typically have a burn-in time due to the JVM and the just-in-time compiler. In our production tests and experience, this is usually on the order of a few minutes, maybe up to five in some cases, uh, but that's just something to notice or something to note. So we do this by using Druid, uh, uh, the uh, EBS reattachment script. We are very happy to open source this tool. If you go into the uh, EBS, or, or go into the MetaMarket's Git repository, it's just called EBS reattach. We'll have an official announcement for it sometime in the next couple of days. So yeah, so if you wanna use EBS reattachment in the way that we use EBS reattachment, please go check out our source code. Uh, if nothing else, you may find it interesting to see the different error messages we've seen come back from the, um, the spot uh, uh, API that is provided, so. Monitoring, everybody who does production stuff needs to know about monitoring. 
We took a look at the spot market itself and said, if only there was some tool that allowed powerful drill down analytics on real time markets. So we took a look at our own stuff and we said, hey, why don't we use our own stuff and dog food using the spot prices, uh, using the spot market, which we do. So we use the, uh, our own tool and able to do, uh, to do slice and dice analytics on the spot market, how the spot market is doing. We have the capacity to do things like uh, look at the average spot price per gigabyte of RAM, see what different instance types are doing over the course of time, and we can both analyze micro and macro trends. So here's an example of a micro trend where you can see for one particular day in September, we had our R32 XLs, which went way, way up above um, what you would expect and, uh, for even an R38 XL, and so you can adjust your, your strategy for where things need to be placed using this kind of information. So you can very easily spot, knowing what the constraints on this program are, where can I actually run it? Which for us is either CPU bound or memory bound, depending on exactly what the, what the uh, particular task is. You can also look at macro trends. I particularly like this one. Uh, this is a graph of what happened to the X132XL spot price over the course of September. Uh, if you look on the left over there, that is not an interesting spot market at all. You simply flap up to the on-demand price and then back down to a very low price. That becomes very hard to predict, predict anything. It becomes very hard to play in overall. But on the right over there, you can see sometime in mid-September something happened and it became a very interesting market to go play in. Final thoughts. So these are a couple of things partly related to spot, partly related to just some of our lessons that we've learned in trying to grow a very large uh, data pool that you can query. Uh, switching from spot to on-demand does not always work. Anytime we have problems in a particular spot pool, that is not an indicator to us to go to on-demand, that is an indicator to us to go seek new resources elsewhere. So our bidding strategy is a little bit over uh, what on-demand is, but we don't actually use that to say switch to on-demand, we use that to say go somewhere else. Your pricing strategy is roughly tuned to the value of lost work, uh, which for us both encompasses the actual machine time, but also a very large component of developer and operator sanity comes into play there. In our own experience, if you're trying to scale in a particular market, meaning one particular instance type in one particular availability zone, you want to do that kind of slowly. If you try to add more than a couple dozen nodes at a time, we tend to spike the spot market. And whereas if instead of asking for 100 nodes at once or 500 nodes at once, if you ask for 10 or 20 at a time, it tends to have a much more smooth effect on the overall price in the spot market. Uh, US East 1 is really crowded. If you can actually play in places that are not US East 1 effectively, um, I highly advise doing so. From stuff related to not spot, but just our cluster in general, if you're able to start with a multi-homed uh, setup, meaning that you have all of your applications assume from the start that they're running in either multiple availability zones or multiple regions, then that will help you grow uh, pretty much unbounded. Uh, U.S. West, or now U.S. Central, are very great places to start if you have not started anywhere yet. Uh, Zookeeper is something that is always causing us pains. Uh, the more Zookeeper quorums that you can maintain, the better. Don't skimp on that. If they go down, think bad things happen. Lastly, uh, be sure, if you can, to try to start out with a cluster resource framework of some kind. So this is a Mesos, this is a Yarn, uh, or if you're just using Spark, the Spark standalone cluster tends to do okay. It does pretty well. The changes in Mesos for Spark 2.0 are fantastic, by the way. So if you haven't really evaluated Mesos and Spark since 1.6, then I highly advise checking it out. Real quick, we are hiring. If this sounds like challenges that you're interested in being a part of, come talk to me or check out our QR link, or QR link up there. Uh, real, so as a summary, we have a great internal tooling for the spot market, both in our EBS reattachment and our insight and analysis on real-time bidding markets. And Spark is working really great with proper configuration, and also Druid is working fantastic for us. So, thank you.